Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to see a few people did make it this morning. You know, I went to bed last night thinking, oh my goodness, I've already lost an hour worth of sleep. And I'm sure you all felt the same way. I just want to encourage you, though, uh, if you know somebody that normally is here on first service, you might want to just like real quick before we get into the Word, just text them and say, hey, wake up, sleepyhead. You missed church. Okay? Because good, thank goodness we have a second service that they can come and actually be here and, be, and hear the message and, you know, hear from God. And not that hearing from me is anything, but hearing from God is always good, right? Praise the Lord for that. We're just thankful that God actually speaks to us, even as uh, um, James was talking about how, how we are unworthy. We are, we are of unclean lips, but we get, to, we get to proclaim His Word. We get to live out His Word. We get to be... Uh, gl- uh, Wash in His glory. I mean, what a, what a blessed thing that is to be uh, part of God's uh, family, part of God's plan, part of God's intention. And it's just an amazing thing to think about. Uh, I don't know if you dwell on that much. I, I could tell that James does. Uh, and I think we all should dwell on that, just how much uh, we are unworthy and that He is worthy. And it's such an awesome thing. Uh, he mentioned in his prayer that Brian is not here, and of course you know he's not because he's not standing up here right now. Uh, so Brian is in the uh, he is in the, the state of Georgia. He is down there at uh, place in a, I think it's Oak Hill or Oak something Baptist Church. I can't remember the name of the church in Cartersville, uh, Georgia. It's just a little north of uh, Atlanta, and uh, he is down there. He is preaching this morning and all week. Uh, they're having a discipleship conference. And uh, if you've looked at our website, maybe seen some things in the bulletin about discipleship conference, big blue uh, image there. And uh, so he is down there preaching uh, this week. Uh, After the services are over today, Tom and myself and Ron, we're all jumping on a plane. We're going down there. We're going to spend the rest of the week down there in this conference as well. We're looking forward to uh, just hearing from our pastor about uh, discipleship. And the, the cool thing is, is is Heartland gets to have an impact because there's going to be churches, pastors and representatives from, I don't know, 20 different churches maybe at this conference uh, in addition to the congregation itself. And so we have the opportunity to speak to all of these churches about something that we are very passionate about, and that's discipleship. Uh, The fact that God uses men and women not just pastors, but all men and women who are willing uh, to invest in lives of other people and and to disciple them. And so we get to talk about that this week. That's really cool. Uh, Be praying for Brian. Be praying for Amy and the family because they're here and he's there. And it's never good to be separated, but, you know, it's doing the Lord's work, so that's important. Um, And uh, uh, so just kind of be in prayer for him as he's speaking. I'm not sure what time their services are this morning, but he's tonight, today, this morning, tonight, and all week, this week, each evening as well. He's the main speaker. That's pretty cool. He was pretty humbled by that. Uh, If you are a first-time guest, uh, I'll probably mention this again at the end of the service, but I just want to welcome you this morning for coming in and being here uh, with us, and we're thankful that uh, you want to spend the time, your time on Sunday morning, hanging out with us. Thanks for coming. uh, I'll probably have something else to say about first-time guests here shortly. But one last thing before we kind of jump into the message. Uh, um, I don't know. Well, last month is when it started, but I've been praying about starting a uh, men's ministry for a long time, and we don't advertise it too much. But uh, I just want to mention, since I had the opportunity to speak in front of the whole church, it's called Iron Forge. It is a men's ministry. Uh, we're reaching out to the men to, to have a, try to have a, an opportunity to impact Uh, and bring all men together. So we meet the second Monday of every month. Uh, So we meet basically one time a month. It's the second Monday, so tomorrow night is the second Monday. Uh, Tyler Scholes is going to bring in the Word. And uh, so if you uh, have not come, have not been invited, you are now invited as a man to come. And uh, so that's basically, if you've got a son uh, that's, you know, around that teenage years, or if you feel that he's capable of handling it, you bring your son. I want him to be there too. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that since uh, we don't talk too much about it publicly. Um, okay, so t- turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to start in 1 Corinthians 10, but that is not uh, where we're going to spend most of our morning. We're going to be in the Old Testament. We're going to be in the book of Numbers and also in the book of Exodus. 
Uh, and, and, and I know some of you like to uh, follow Brian's messages. He uses PowerPoint. Um, I know how to make a PowerPoint. Uh, I just, I, I literally ran out of time. Uh, I didn't have the time. I'm, I'm eating breakfast running around the kitchen this morning because I just didn't have time. So I apologize for not having a PowerPoint. If you want a title for this message, because Brianna, she's always, you know, trying to put that in the bulletin if you know that there's not a title there. So the title of this message would be A Checklist for a Right Relationship with God. A Checklist for, with, for a Right Relationship with God. So the thing that we all have to understand is that God wants, and we always say this, right? This is what we gets about a relationship. Well, what does that mean, anyway? And so we're going we're gonna try to try to break some of that stuff down and, and uh, kind of get to it. So uh, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to start there because uh, there's something important that we need to see before we jump back into the Old Testament. Starting in verse 1, Paul writes this. He says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did eat the same spiritual meat and drink, of, drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But here's the key, here's, this is what I want to focus on, these next two verses. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to pause right now and we just want to thank you for being God. We want to thank you for being a holy, real, true, and absolute God. We want to thank you for being a God that invites us into fellowship with you. I pray, Father, this morning that you would uh, take this op opportunity, to take this hour, this time that we have here, Father, and that you would, that you would uh, speak to our hearts, that you would command our attention, and that you would uh, uh, overthrow our own desires, and that you would take from us the things that don't belong in us and give us what you want us to have. I pray, Father, that you would... Uh, just speak to our hearts this morning as we examine the example that we have in the Old Testament. Help us to have that relationship that you desire for us, but not only that, help us define what that looks like this morning, and we praise you for it, and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so, so Paul writes there in verse, in, in verse 6, he talks about a critical lesson for us, right? A critical lesson that we all need to learn. We all need to grasp this. If, if we are going to experience all that God has for us, we better learn the lesson that is talked about in the Old Testament. Because if we don't, we're going to follow the problems. We're going to be the same kind of person that Israel was. I mean, why did he say that in verse 6? Why did he say, in verse 5 and 6, God... That this, is, this, is, this ought to be scary to you. God was not pleased with their behavior. That ought to scare you. That ought to make you tremble in your boots. That God would not be pleased with you. Because it scares me. It scares me to think that God, who loved me when I didn't deserve it, who saved me when I didn't deserve it, who sacrificed his son for me, would not now be pleased in me. That, does, that, does that even, like, register? I mean, oh my goodness. That God, you know, we're going to see God one day, right? We're all going to, we're all going to, I say we're standing in front of the judgment seat. We're not going to stand. We're, we'll be lucky if we're kneeling. We're going to be laid out flat on our face because we have nothing I mean, we're going to try to get as low as we can because we are that low. And we're going to try to address the living God. Oh, my goodness, that ought to scare us all to death. Uh, really, all, all to life, actually. Anyway, okay, so he's talking about this lesson that we need to learn 
so that God would, so that we could experience everything in our life that God wants us to be, and be a part of what God is doing in this world. Now, mo- now we're going to start off in Numbers. So we'll be turning back over to the book of Numbers. I'm sorry I don't have page numbers if you're using uh, one of the uh, Bibles that are in the pew. But hey, if you look over and see somebody fumbling around in their Bible, just reach over and help them. That way you get to know them, right? You can uh, actually, you know, start a relationship with them too. Uh, because maybe they're not familiar with, with where the book of Numbers is found in the Old Testament. But Moses wrote the book of Numbers, right? He wrote the first book, the first five books of the, New Te- of the Old Testament. And Numbers details for us uh, Israel's 40-year journey in the wilderness, right? You all know that, right? They, they wandered for 40 years. The issue is why did they have to wander? Because God wasn't pleased with them. That's what Paul is talking about. That's what refer- he's referring to. And so What's really the, probably the most critical ver- chapter is chapter 14. So we're going we're gonna to go to Numbers chapter 14. See, Israel, Israel had to learn a hard lesson. And so I'm sad, it's sad to say that many Christians are going to have to learn the same hard lesson that Israel had to learn. That lesson, that lesson is that your own reasoning is not the foundation of a relationship with God. Your own rational position is not the reason for the relationship. It doesn't justify that relationship. They didn't understand that, and they need to give it to God. We need to give it. God, God is, he, he is the most important. He is the righteous one. He defines how things ought to be too many times, and it's, and it's constant. Every place you turn in Christianity, what I call the, the commerce of Christianity they define how God ought to be with us instead of God defining how we ought to be with Him. And it's time for us to turn away from all of that and turn to what God wants us to do. So when you look over at Numbers chapter 14, let me jump over there too. In Numbers chapter 14, there's a couple of places that I want you to look at. Now, I know, I know what Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18 says, and you probably know too, it says where God is pleading with us, right? And He says, Come and let us reason together. Right? You remember that verse? Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be white as snow. But that's not, he's not saying, I want your reasons. Really, God is not saying, I want your, what he's saying is you need to come and listen to what I have to say. And you need to take what I have to say to heart and become who you need to be. What I say is so important. But many times, we would rather God listen to our reasons for how our relationship ought to be. And that's, that's so wrong. We think that what we want to do and the way we want to do it is the right way. And we want God to fall in line. Sometimes our prayers even mimic that. They mimic how we want God to do for us instead of, God, how can I do for you? And so the hardest struggle that we have, even as these Israelites, they had the same struggle. The hardest struggle that we have is coming to the belief that God actually knows what he's talking about. He actually does. He actually knows what he talks, he's talking about. And not only that, what he's telling us is truth. It is true. And we have a hard time accepting that. And, and, and it, you know what? What we don't recognize is that what, everything that God says, even if we don't like it, everything that God says is for our good. And there's not a thing in this Bible that is written to hurt you. Not one thing. Everything is said, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. But we don't. Say, no, I will. We, we condition our coming. I'll come to you, God, if. Uh, or God, get me out of this problem, and I'll come to you. I mean, we always condition things, right? And so we have a hard time with that. So living our life God's way, despite what friends and what other people say, Tell us what they how, concerning the right way. It's a challenging situation. Proverbs chapter fourteen and verse twelve says this. Proverbs fourteen twelve. There is a way which seemeth right unto man. Right. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We have to recognize that it is not our ways that are right. It's God's ways that are right, and we should just fall in line. Israel's mistake was recorded in, the, in two verses in chapter 14. There's two verses that, that kind of indicate what the whole problem that Paul was talking about. So the first one is uh, verse 11. Numbers 14, verse 11. 
Look what it says. And the Lord spake unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them? How long are you going to provoke me? And then later on in verse, 20, uh, verse 22, look what he says in verse 22. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have tempted me now these ten times, and have not hearkened to my voice. You see, what, Paul, what God is saying to Moses is, what is wrong with you people? That's what he's saying. That would be the way we would say it today. What is wrong with you? So they had provoked God. You know what that means in verse 11? To provoke God, they reviled him. They scorned him. They rejected him. All the whole time, God's trying to lead them where? To his promises. Right? They tested him. That's what it means in verse 21 to, or 22 to be tested or tempted. They tempted God. They tested him. They're trying his patience. You know how that is if you're a mom or a dad, right? Your kids, you know, you, you, okay, I'm going to, you know, I count to 10. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count. I'm not counting anymore. Right? That's kind of how we do it. So they tested him. Now, now, God normally tests us, right? He puts us through the paces. He tries our hearts. He wants to make sure who we are. But this is not what's happening here. They're testing God. That's a pretty bold and I would like to say a pretty dumb thing to do, tempting God, testing God, trying Him, reviling Him. We should never go there. I mean, how, how, that's why Paul wrote that God was not well pleased with them. I, that's a scary thing. These verses that we read in, in, chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they speak of a vital lesson. And this is the lesson. You need to get this. What happened to Israel can happen to us if we do not have a right relationship with God. What happened to them will happen to us in our personal walk with the Lord right now today if we don't do what, they're supposed to, what they were supposed to do. So for most people, the concept, you know, when we say it's not a religion, it's a relationship, you know, it's about a relationship with God and all you know, what do we, what do you actually mean by that? What does that actually mean? You know what we normally think that means or we kind of, kind of go there, it's like, well, that usually means that you need to be saved, right? Uh, you, you need to be in church, right? You need to be discipled. You need to be involved in ministry. That's the relationship, right? So if, I'm, if I come to church on Sundays, am I right with God? Not always. If I'm saved, but in the world, am I right with God? Is my relationship right? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. If, I, if I'm a ministry lead or ministry head, am I, is my walk with the Lord right? Absolutely not. That's not the gauge. See, here's the thing. You know, what, what, what God said to Moses in, in verse 22 was that they tempted him not once, not twice, not even three times. He, they tempted him ten times. Ten times. And those ten times, I think, give us ten specific things or topics uh, categories of how we should relate to God if we're going to have a right relationship to God. So we can look at the example in Numbers, and we're going to go back to Exodus 2, and we can see in, this, in those ten rebellious behaviors what we should do to be right with God. Okay? That's kind of where we're going this morning. That's what we're going to look at. Okay, number one, go back to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. Now, you know, Exodus, uh, well, I'll just tell you. Okay, number one, if you're writing this down, Exodus chapter 14, their first problem, their first rebellion uh, was they did not trust in God's salvation. They did not trust in God's salvation. Okay, so uh, if we would uh, start in verse 10. If you want to, you, you can make this note. I'm not, not going to read all the verses but if you start in verse 10, go down through verse 13, you'll see the whole situation, actually further than that. But just look at verse 10. Exodus chapter 14 and verse 10. This is what it says. And when Pharaoh drew nigh 
the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Okay, so that's all good so far. All right, that's good. That's good. Okay, but then what he says in verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Wow. Okay, so verse, the first, verse 10 was good. The rest of it, not so good, right? Not so good. So Moses told them, all the way back in Exodus chapter 4, we won't turn there, but you can make a note. Exodus chapter 4 and verses 29 to 31. Moses had already been up to the mount. He'd been with the burning bush. He had talked to, to God. God says, you know what? I'm going to use you to go and rescue my people. And there was this whole dialogue that took place. And Moses comes to the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel, when he, when he gets back to town. And he says, hey, God is going to save you. He's going to save all of us. He's heard your cry. And they said, praise God. We believe you. And then they worship God. Okay. So they already knew that there was, there was salvation coming. They already understood all of that. They, they were expecting it. And th then you know what? From chapter 5 to chapter 12, what did they see? They saw the miracles. They saw the plagues. They saw the mighty hand of God moving. They saw what God was doing to the Egyptians and what God was not doing to the Isra Israelites. He's, God, God was working through all of that. They saw all of that. And then it says... In chapter 12, that God paid the ultimate price for their salvation, right? Every firstborn child died. We call that the Passover, right? That situation, that, 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 uh, that event where God passed over those that had the blood uh, painted on the door, spread on the, on the upper doorpost and the side doorpost. He, had, he passed over them, a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our salvation. But now, now they're up to the, they're, they're facing the Red Sea, on one side, and behind them is the army of the Egyptians coming after them, and they're like, oh my God, oh my God, let us alone, please. Isn't that amazing? Oh, that we should have died in Egypt. Let us go back there and serve the Egyptians. It's an incredible thing they're saying. I know you saved us, but I'd really rather be back in the world. I know when I first got saved, uh, I've told this story a few times, but when I first got saved, I told the guy that invited me to be disciples, and no thanks. I got it all down. I got it down. I'm saved. I got things to do, places to go, people to see. I got a job to do. I got this and I got that. I don't have time for that church stuff. It wasn't a few months later when I got to start getting discipled, praise the Lord. But here's the thing. That's what they were doing. They say, no thanks. We don't want what you have, God. We don't want that offer. We don't need that offer. And so... See, they would rather have gone back into the system that had burdened them and broken them than preferring what God offered in salvation. How many times do people get saved and they say, thanks, God, see you later? And that's what happened here with Israel. They said, thanks, God, see you later. They thought it was easier to serve Egypt than to trust God. There is no easier thing than to trust God. Absolutely no easier. I mean, you know what? You don't die from trusting God. You have life forever from trusting God. Now, like Israel, sometimes we may be a bit unsure where we're headed. You know, we got saved, and I don't know what the next step is going to be. You know, we don't know where we're going. God, if God gave you the picture of everything in your life for the next 40 years after your salvation, you'd run for the hills. I know that. Uh, but that's, but that, God says, don't do, I'm not going to tell you. So, you know, so, so sure, we don't always know. But we know we are saved but sometimes we don't comprehend it. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 17 and through 19. Ephesians 3, 17 says this, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which patheth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what you need to know when you got saved. If you just know that right there and you rest in that, you trust in that, Everything else take care of itself. They had that. It, standing in front of the Red Sea, they're looking at the Red Sea and the army of the Pharaoh coming. They had that, and they said, no thanks. Our problem is that we move too far from this truth 
about what it costs God for our salvation and how blessed we are. And then like Israel, we know what we do. We do the next thing. The next thing is is that we question God. That's number two. Their their temptation number two in Exodus chapter 15 is they questioned God's protection. So God got them over the Red Sea, right? He went ahead. He said, Moses, just do this. And they went across the Red Sea. They saw the victory, and they saw everything happen. You know, in, in, in chapter 14 and verse 30, it says, The Lord saved Israel that day. Out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. So they're looking. Even though they said, oh, let me go back to Egypt, God said, no, just hang on a second. Let me show you what's going to happen. God got victory over that enemy, and they saw the dead laying on the, on the seashore. And they, you know what? Chapter 15, the first 21 verses of chapter 15, you know what it is? It's a song of praise. They sang praise. They wrote a song about the victory, and they sang it. That's that's incredible, right? Up until verse 22. And then in verse 22, um, really verse 22 through verse 27, I'm just going to read starting in verse 24. Exodus 15, uh, verse 24 says this, And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, that he, and there he proved them. See, after the Red Sea triumph, they sang this song, but then they got to this place three days down the road where they had no water. Right? They, there was no water to drink except this bitter, there was a pond or a lake, or I don't know how big this thing was, but there was water and it was bitter, meaning it was diseased. It wasn't fit for drinking. And so what did they do? They complained. They questioned God's protection. That's the second thing here they did. They questioned his protection. Don't we do that? Don't we, don't we challenge God in his protection of our life? And so they murmured and they complained and they demanded, they demanded something be done. And so in response, Moses, what does he do? God tells him, you know, he said, hey, uh, do this. God tells him in verse 26 to hearken to his voice. Uh, and obey his commandments, and basically just do what you're supposed to do. That's what he says. Do what you're supposed to do in verse 26. And then he took this tree that was there, and he cast it into the water, that tree being a type of the cross, because that is where you get your protection. You are protected from, ever, from anything forever now because of the cross. You don't have to fear God, anything. You are protected. You're a child of the king. You are a a servant of the Most High God. That means something. And so, and so that tree was cast into the water. And you know what it says in, in John? Uh, John chapter 7 and verse 38 says this, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And so today we might ask, can I lose my salvation? Because I don't trust in God's protection. You know, that would be how we might say it sometimes. Can I even lose my salvation? Yet we don't need to question God whether he will protect us or not. Of course he will protect us. Sadly, there were those there who would rather drink the bitter, diseased water of the world and instead of taking on the living water of God's Son, Jesus Christ. They don't drink in that water. They they just ignore it. And then that brings us to the next one, the, the third uh, temptation in the Exodus chapter 16. If you notice, we're just following a few chapters right along here. Exodus chapter 16. Now, Exodus chapter 16 is interesting because there's three uh, temptations right in a row. They're all basically the same topic, but they're all right there. They're all connected together. Okay, so in verse chapter 16, uh, just read verse, the first three verses, but it goes from verse 1 to 8. Um, what, what, let me make sure I tell you. They resisted God's law. That was the third temptation. They resisted God's law. Okay, so, and they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. I always liked that. The wilderness of sin. And when you look at this chapter, you see why. Because it's nothing but sin. All of, every, sin, three times they sin. Anyway, and say, uh, <clears throat> which is between the, uh, Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God, they say this a lot, Would to God that we had died in the, uh, 
by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay, first it was an army of the enemy, and then it was nothing to drink, and now it's, you're starving us to death, God. Come on. That's, so they're challenging him. They're challenging everything about him. And so, uh, uh, so they're angry with nothing to eat. Now, when they left Egypt, they took food with them. You know, they had their unleavened, uh, uh, food, or unleavened bread that they had taken, all that. I mean, they had prepared it. They, so they, they hauled a bunch of food with them, but the, by the time we get here 45 days out, they're out of food. So they're murmuring against God and longing for the days when they had more than enough to eat. See, God will try your heart where you think God fails you. Listen to me. God will try your heart where you think God fails you. Because he's going to see, do you really think I'm failing you? Do you really think I'm messing up here? Okay, so John chapter 4 and verse 32, is Jesus says, But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And then later on in, in, the, in John chapter 4 verse 34, uh, just two verses later, he says, My meat is... Is to see his disciples, right? They came back. They said, "Who brought him food?" I, I thought we were supposed to go to town and get food. They come back with physical food, and, go, and Jesus looks at him and says, "No, you don't understand. My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. My meat, the food that I need to really consume, is God's work, not that physical stuff that's going to be, you know, wasted in a few hours." Okay, so the question was not whether God would fill up their flesh pots and fill up their bread boxes, but whether they would be filled by following His will. That's really the question here. Are you going to be filled by God, or are you going to expect God to fill you? So, I didn't say, that's a, that kind of sounded the same way, didn't it? It's like heads, tails, heads I win, tails you lose. Anyway, so let me, reset, let me say that again. Uh, the question is not whether God will fill up your flesh pots. The, the question is whether you will be filled by His will. Are you going to eat what God is offering you, or are you going to demand God give you something physical? So, God said in verse 4, I'll prove whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, we typically want God, this is what we do, we want God to do for us, but we lack the resolve to move with an intentional adherence to His Word. We lack the resolve to move with an intentional adherence to His Word. What I'm, so what I'm saying is we basically ignore what God said. We pretty much ignore everything that God says. We do whatever we want. We want to fill our bellies instead of following in His will. We don't, we, we don't do that like we should. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, you know what it says? For our light affliction, which was but a, for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. Our light affliction. I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have food in my stomach. That's okay. It's just a light affliction. What you need to be doing is working for God's glory. So that's the first. That was number three, right? They, they, they resisted his word. Number four, down in verse 16 of this same chapter, they rejected God's provision. So first they, they ignore his word or they resist his word. And now they reject what he's offering them. They reject what he's offering. Look in verse 16. Verse 16 says, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it. Now, he's talking about the manna, right? He, and that whole story there is about the manna. And he says, this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it every man according to his eating, and omer for every man, according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for, for them which are in his tents. And the children of, di of Israel did so, and gathered some more, some less. But verse 18 says, and when they did met it, means they counted it out, with an omer, he that gathered much had no, nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to his eating. And then in verse 19, and Moses said, let no man leave of it till the morning. Basically, everything you gather, you eat. Everything you gather, you eat. And God says, you know what? It doesn't matter how much you went out and picked up. What you picked up is exactly what God wanted you to eat. Do you ever think about it that way? That God defines for us what we should consume? But we, cons but, you know, we decide, no, I'm going to 
eat more or eat less? And what, what did they do? What, what, what was their problem here? So they rejected his provision. When they went out and gathered food, some had more, some had less, they had the promise of, ever, of always having exactly what God intended for them. But you know what they did? They didn't enjoy what God intended for them. They set aside some for the next day. They put it aside. They had a promise of always having what God wanted, but they wouldn't enjoy it. They chose not to enjoy what God had for them. We cannot, here's the thing, we cannot set aside the provision of God for a later time at our convenience. God gives us what He wants us to have when, we, when He wants us to have it. Romans chapter 11, verse 13, uh, sorry, Romans 13, verse 14 says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. We, shouldn't, we, should, we, don't, we don't provide for the flesh. God doesn't provide for our flesh. He provides for our soul. He provides for our eternal life. Their problem, Israel's problem, was they lusted after possessing God's provision instead of working in God's provision. Job chapter 23, verse 12 says this in the Old Testament, Job, neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. What, what Job is saying, what, what, what Paul is saying in Romans, and what Israel failed to do, is that we don't need to take his word and parse it out. God wants us to fill ourselves up with his word every day. His, so God's word, his, his scripture, his Bible, is necessary. It's that necessary food. Uh, but we can't leave it for later. We have to consume it every day when he's given it to us. We must eat it daily in the portions that he has for us. We can't rush through it, and we should never store up God's word for later on. That's what he's saying there. That's what they did. They rejected God's provision. And then number five, in the same chapter, they did not recognize God's holiness. So three things that they did, that's why it's called the wilderness of sin. They resisted his word, they uh, rejected his provision, and then third thing is they did not recognize his holiness. Look at verse 23. Verse 23 of the same chapter says, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye bake in today, and see that which ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you will lay up for you to keep until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was it any worm in therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? See, what they were doing here was they were not recognizing God's holiness. We ignore the holiness of God so often. It's an incredibly amazing thing that we do that. Every seven days, they were supposed to lay up and store enough for two days, right? On the sixth day, and then they have enough for the seventh day, so they weren't supposed to go out and, and, uh, and gather it up. That word, lay up, that, that, that phrase, lay up, it means to rest, to pause, to be settled and that's not what they were doing. The Sabbath day was a day of rest, and they were to gather enough for two days. But here again, instead of resting in His holiness, they went in search of provision that wasn't there. They went looking for something that was not there. God said, I've given you what you need. Rest in it. And He said, you know what? I know you're a holy God. I know that's a holy day to you, but I don't care. I'm doing what I want. They resisted. They rejected they ignored, they did not recognize His holy day. They were not holy because they did not see that God was holy. In 1 Peter chapter, 15, chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, you're probably familiar with this verse. But as, he hath, but as He which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And they said, nah, that's okay, I don't have time for that. I'm not recognizing your holiness, I'm doing what I want to do. And then number six, number six is that they doubted God's presence. In, verse, in chapter 17, starting in verse 1, they doubted God's presence. 
Look at 17. It says in verse 1, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord and said, What shall I do unto this people that they be almost ready to stone me? Amazing. An amazing thing. They doubted God's presence. They doubted that God was in their life. I mean, after all they've seen, after all they've experienced, they're doubting that God is in their life. Okay, so this is the second instance of, a, of an issue with water. Having departed from the wilderness of sin, they come to this place called Rephidim, which, is, which means, literally it means a rail or a resting place. Um, but they were not resting there. It's a place where they would later do battle with the Amalekites. But for right now, it was a simply a place where they doubted whether God was with them or not. And so their thirst... Again, their thirst led to a murmuring, but this time they were going to stone Moses. And now this is the, this is the story. We don't have time to really dig into all of these things. You, know, you could probably make a whole series out of all ten of these. But God commands Moses to strike the, rock, to strike the rock with his staff, and the water comes gushing out. Israel's demand that God prove his presence among them betrayed their lack of faith. Then we do that sometimes. You know, you got that picture, right, that, that uh, you see it everywhere. Probably not so much today, but, you know, on the beach, you know, there's two footprints, right, walking side by, and all of a sudden there's only one footprint. What happened? Well, God, you left me. And then God says, no, I didn't leave you. I picked you up. I'm, I never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm always with you, he says. But how many times do we say, God, where are you? God, don't you see that I'm struggling here? God, don't you see that I'm having problems here? God, don't you see my marriage? Don't you see my kid? Don't you see my... We're saying, God, where are you? That's, the whole, that, that's what we do every time. We don't recognize that God is always present. In Psalm chapter 95, verses 8 and 9, don't do what Israel did. Don't harden your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Don't, be, don't harden your heart against God. So he named the place Mera, oh, I'm sorry, Masa. And that word means uh, tested. They tested God. He called it Masa and Meribah, for they strove with God. There was a striving there. These names, when God puts a name in a place, he names them for a reason. And so they tested God, and they strove with God. They doubted his presence. And then the seventh one, the seventh temptation is in Exodus chapter 32. And I'm not even going to go into the whole chapter, because you all know what Exodus chapter 32 is, right? I will read verses 1 to 4. Let's do that. Exodus 32. And, the people, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Make up, uh, up, make us gods which, go, which shall go before us, for as this Moses, the man that... For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And Aaron said, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the earrings, the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So this next time, this number seven here, what they did was they refused God's sovereignty. They refused His sovereignty. This is getting really dangerous, by the way, because you see a pattern here, progression. It's getting really dangerous. Now, like I said, we don't have time to get into chapter 32. This is basically Moses is up in the mountain getting the Ten Commandments. They're down in the, in the valley making, a, making a, a, a golden calf to worship. Here's the thing. Back in chapter 19 is when they got to Mount Sinai. So from chapter 19 to verse 32, they see everything that's happening. They know what God is doing. They see Moses going up into the mount. 
and coming down. They see his face change. His countenance has changed so much that he has to put a veil on. They, they see the rumblings and they, they, they know that God is present. They know that he is, exists. And then not only that, but in chapter 19 and verse 8, God comes down and he says, hey, if you do this, I'll do that. If you would, if you would, if you would obey me, I will be your God. And they said, no problem. You will, in verse 8, they say, okay, I will obey you because you're God. And we get down to verse, or chapter 32, and they said, sorry, uh, we're going to make us an idol, because they had rejected God as the only true God. They had rejected His sovereignty. They said, no, He is not. We refuse that He is the only God. We just need this idol, and then we can do what we want. We can reason among ourselves and go our way. Okay, so sovereignty, sovereignty is the ability of God to do His holy will, Okay, so that would be a definition that I would give. It is, it is the ability of God to do all of His holy will. It is His right to do all things according to His good pleasure. That is sovereignty. You guys understand, right? A king, like a king of a country or, you know, an emperor or whatever, they have, they're sovereign. They, they, what they say goes and what God says goes. First Chronicles chapter 29, First Chronicles 29, verse 11 and 12 says, Thine, O Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. That is sovereignty. And what they said when they made this idol is that, God, you're not sovereign. We refuse your sovereignty, God. We get to decide who's going to be our God. What they're saying, in essence, is, God, I'm sovereign. I'm sovereign. I decide who's my God. They refused his sovereignty and chose theirs. Oh, that's a scary thing, isn't it? That's, that's, that ought to be scary. Number eight. We're just trick. We're clicking right along here. Number eight. Go book. Now we got to go over to numbers now because we jump over all the time that God talked about building the tabernacle and the book of Leviticus and everything. We get to numbers. Numbers chapter eleven. This is the eighth of all their temp- their testing, their temptations of God. And this and this. This temptation was that they complained of God's sufficiency. They complained of His sufficiency. What they're saying is, God, you're not enough. You are not enough, God. So after departing from Mount Sinai, they grumbled and they complained because God was taking... Here's, God, this, is, this is what we do. This is what Christians do. God was taking them someplace that they knew not and they didn't like moving. God was moving them, and they didn't want to go. God was saying, follow me, and they didn't want to go. Look what he says in verse 1. And when the people complained to displease the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched, and he called the name of the place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Their complaint was rooted in their perception that God's promise of a land of milk and honey was not evident. Sometimes, you know, we get so impatient with God. We get so long in the tooth, waiting for God to do something, and we just say, you know what, I'm tired of waiting on you, God. I'm doing it myself. God, God's promises are always fulfilled. Never should we think that God doesn't fulfill His promises They grew discontent with God, blaming God for what they believed was a fruitless march in the wilderness. Sometimes we think that. We don't see where God is taking us, so we think that because we don't see it, then God is just jacking us around. And so so we we, we don't believe in His sufficiency. Their problem was that they could not find sufficiency in God. You know what he says, what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3? He says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 
Our sufficiency is of God. Not, we, we are not sufficient of ourselves. He also says in chapter 9, verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. He is sufficient to everything that we need to get done. But we don't think so sometimes. We think, oh, I've got to do it myself. I've got to help God. Because God, you know, obviously God doesn't know what he's doing. I do, because I'm right here. God's up there. I'm here. Isn't that how we do it sometimes? Okay, so how sad to think that our needs and our desires and our longings cannot be met by God. And then number nine, Numbers chapter 11, still in chapter 11, and man, it's really the rest of the chapter. This is probably the one I'd like to dwell on the most, but I don't have the time. This is where they disrespected God's authority. They disrespected God's authority. And I'm just going to read verses 4 to 6. Numbers 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish, we, which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away, there is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Isn't that incredible? Back in Exodus 16, they were complaining about not having food, and God gave them everything that they needed to eat. And now they're complaining, eh, I don't like the taste. I want a new recipe. I want some more ingredients. It's an incredible thing. What, what really is happening here, though, is they're disrespecting his authority. Let me just say, discontentment. Their discontentment became sin, manifest as lust. Their sin was lust, but it was because they were discontent with God. They had a lust for food, not because they didn't have any food, because they were rejecting what God was doing. In Psalm chapter 78, Psalm chapter 78, verse 19, it says, They spake against God. They said, Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? I mean, can God, can God give me a buffet table? I mean, I don't think he can. That's what they're saying. I don't think he can give me a buffet, a smorgasbord of food. I don't think he can do it. I don't think he has the authority to do it. <clears throat> so even Moses, by now Moses is frustrated. Look what he says in verse 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then Moses heard the people weep through their fam throughout their families, every man in the door of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. God's answer to Moses and to us really is found in verse 23. This is what God, God said, and this is what we should do. The Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Thou shalt see whether my, my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. See, God brought so much food as a result of their whining and their lusting. He brought so much food that they couldn't consume it. And while they had it in their mouth, while they were trying to eat it in verse 33, he said that his wrath was kindled against them and many, and he smote them. Let me just say this. The authority of God is, a thing, is, is not a thing that you should disrespect. For there is no authority that does not come from God. All Authority comes from God. In John chapter 19, in verse 11, when Jesus Christ is speaking to Pilate, you know, he's been arrested, he's, he's on trial, and, and he looks over at Pilate, and he says, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. All power comes from above. All authority comes from above. Matthew 28, 18 says the same thing. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. All power, everything, it's mine, and I delegate it the way I see fit. Let me just say this. The acts of God that issue forth from his throne, and his th the acts of God, they come from his throne, right? Everything that God does, he sits on the throne, and they come from him. And his throne, you ever wonder about this? His throne is established on his authority. Just like any king that has a throne, any place in history, that was the throne represented the authority. Who sat on the throne had authority. God sits on the throne of the universe. It is his authority. His throne represents his authority. All things, all laws, all life is maintained by God's authority. Hebrews, look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 says this. 
Uh, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, by his glory, by his power, by the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, the power of God's word. The power of God's word is derived from God's authority. You ever think about that? You, you have no power in your word if you have no authority to back it up. God's word, his power and his word was backed by his authority. To sin against God's authority is to sin against God himself. Every delegated authority represents God's delegated authority. Every person that has authority represents God's authority. That's why Moses was so angry, because the people had rejected, they had, they had disrespected God's authority, because Moses was a delegated authority of God. Look in verse 17. Let me get back there. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 17. And I will come down. Let me verse 16. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with me, or with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee there. And I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and put it upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. What God says is, I'm going to take some of your authority, and I'm going to delegate it to those men. My authority, delegated to you, Moses, is now going to be spread among 70 people here. So God has put his authority. Think about this. God has put his authority on your pastor. God has put your authority on your husband. God has put his authority on your ministry lead. God has put, your, his, put his authority on your parent, on your government. And disrespecting them disrespects God's authority. When you reject the authority that's been delegated to a person from God, you're basically saying, God, I disrespect you. And that's what Moses is dealing with. That's what God is dealing with in this situation here. That's the ninth situation here. That's the whole problem right there. Is they basically were disrespecting his authority and all those other things come at it. But number, number 10, and this will be the finish, we'll, we'll try to wrap this up. They would not rest in his promises. We're back in Numbers chapter 14 now. They would not rest in his promises. And you know what happened in chapter 13? Chapter 13, Moses sends spies into the land. The spies come back with an evil report, it says, except for Caleb and, and uh, Joshua. And so what they were doing here, this last temptation, it's the last straw for God because God has given so much grace to Israel. They were about to enter into the promise of God, but they feared and they resisted. Their fear of the inhabitants of the land was greater than the wish of the promise of God. Their fear overran the, com the, the comfort of their promise. They cried all night, mourning, uh, murmuring against God, instead of rejoicing over finally arriving at that promise that he had said it was going to happen. It would be kind of like you and me standing at the, at the uh, entry into heaven and say, I don't, I'm not going in there. I don't know what's on the other side. I refuse to die. That's, that, that, that's how, see how silly that is? I'm not going to die physically because I don't want to go to heaven because I, I don't know what heaven's like. Guys, the people are I don't know what's in there. I'm not going. Verse 4 says they wanted to return. To, again, they want to go back. After all these years, they want to go back to Egypt. I just, it's amazing. I just, I, I'm, every time I think about it, I'm just... I'm just dumbfounded by the whole thing. They had experienced all the grace that God had given, but they still wanted to go back. And so Moses and Aaron prayed, and jo Caleb and Joshua rent their clothes in anguish, and they tried to convince them, but they were almost stoned. Numbers chapter 14, verse 11, where we started. How long will you provoke me, and how long will you air be that you believe me? And then God speaks to Moses about his judgment on the people, and he concludes with this verse in, in verse 21. He says in verse 21, But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God says, I don't care what you think. My glory will fill the world. Yours, not so much. 
how, could we, how can we stand against that? Wouldn't we, don't we want, don't you and I want God's glory to fill the earth? If you could do something that would hasten the day when God's glory filled the earth, wouldn't you do it? You see, therein lies the problem. We have ten rebellions, ten failures, ten actions or inactions that keep God's glory at bay. And we do the same thing. So there's a checklist real quick here, a checklist for a right relationship. All of this stuff that we had. Like many Christians, Israel thought it was about, all about them, all about their blessing, all about their joy, all about their righteousness. Isn't that how we think about Christianity today? It's all about me. But it's not. It's when we acknowledge God and live for God, that's when we get all those blessings. But we shouldn't do it for the blessings. We just do it so God's glory will fill the earth. God will bless you. He will protect you. He will give. But only when we give Him the glory due His name. Psalm chapter 29, David writes this in verses 1 and 2. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. We need to give him the glory on everything. Okay, so here's this quick checklist, just so in case you missed them. We'll flip it around. This is what you ought to do. You want to define a relationship with God? This is how you define it. Trust in his salvation. Trust in it. I mean, some things can really happen in a, in a bad way in your life, but, then, you know, you can always say, but I am held fast by God. Trust in His salvation. Be confident in His protection. Number three, agree with His law. Agree with His word. Number four, accept what He provides. Number five, recognize His holiness. Number six, believe that He is present. Number seven, respect His sovereignty. Number eight, submit to His authority. Number nine, praise His sufficiency. Got those two out of order, actually. And number ten, rest in His promise. You see, if we would just do that, that would cover all of our relationship issues with God. We would be in a right relationship with God if we would just do these things. There's no, there's no other way around it. We have to be this. We have to do this. And so as we conclude, as we wrap up this thing, I'm just, let me just say this. If you have an issue with God, it's probably one of these ten things. You probably are like Israel. Go back, study this out, figure out where your life is not lining up with what we need to do, and is your life lining up with Israel? And if it is, change it. And I don't know, maybe you need to get saved. Maybe, maybe the first thing is you can't trust in His salvation because you haven't been saved. And if you haven't been saved, then the rest of these things just aren't working in your life. So you've got to start with that. So let's all pray right now. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. And we'll just